What's going on, everyone? Mike Plachter, that flipping accountant, uh, owner of We Buy Long Island Homes Fast. And today I got uh, Jamie Weinberg, uh, Homes by Jamie J, Realty Connect. Um, really excited to have you on. You know, I've been looking forward to this for a little while now. I'm trying to set this up and just excited to have you on. Yes, awesome. I'm so glad that you asked me and I'm sorry that I had to reschedule once. I'm such a stickler for time and scheduling, no matter what's going on, like, I try to be where I'm supposed to be. So thank you for your patience. And I'm absolutely. glad we made it happen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I guess so I wanted to just kind of like get a little bit into you and tell me, you know, kind of like tell me about yourself, like all that stuff. Um, I guess, you know, you know, your realtor, Realty Connect. Uh, could you just tell me a little bit about yourself? Sure. So yes, I am an associate real estate broker. I also own a small property management business. And prior to this, in my former life, I was a litigation paralegal for several years. So that area of focus was mainly bankruptcy, short sales, foreclosure defense, foreclosure litigation, uh, loan modifications, and short sales. So oh, I used wow. to do all of that stuff on a daily basis. But um, I got my real estate license in 2005. And... That was a really bad time to work in a commission based yeah. business. <laughs> is that so the short sale, like the background short sales, do you still do? Do you focus on short sales a lot? Or that's just something you're you just grew up in that field and you don't really do a lot of short sales today. Cause I, I don't see you do I see you doing a lot of like direct to homeowner type of uh, you know, selling a lot in Blue Ridge, things of that nature. Right. Um, so kind of the niche that I've fallen into is residential. I do a little bit of commercial. I do a little bit of um, short sales and investments, but my main bread and butter has been condos and co-ops and it just kind of fell out that way. So I'm proficient in short sales, but there was a time where I was doing a pipeline of like 50 short sales at a time. And now I mainly focus on residential deals, but when short sales come in, I know how to handle them and I have a whole team that can work on them with me, but that's just not um, what I focus my energy on. Most of my business is referral-based. I'd say like 95% of it is referral-based. So if I was advertising or actively seeking that type of business, then I could do it, but you know, I've just, I've become happy and content with, with where I'm at. Yeah, that's like a whole nother niche you have to like learn because I, I got my first short sale. Uh, it's under contract and I'm not even that like confident it's going to get to the closing table. Um, you know, it's just we didn't even get to the point where we know the bank's number, but I just have a feeling they're going to come back at a high number. And it's like, I don't know if now is the best time to, to get into short sales, you know, because banks, from what I'm seeing, they want a lot of money for like their their buyout number is just really high. It doesn't really make sense. But if you're like a listing agent, it doesn't really matter because you're going to get the listing anyway. And I think they pay like five or 6%, which is really good. Yeah. Uh, standard standard on a short is 6%. And there are also a couple of other fees that can be thrown in there on the HUD. You can put in a negotiating fee. You can put oh. different fees and add more money onto it on top of your compensation. So there's a couple of different tricks of the trade that I've learned over time. And the BPO that you just talked about a lot of people think that is like the end all be all and that's the holy grail. And whenever that number comes in, that's what it is. But I've actually had the experience of submitting value disputes, which I typically always do, regardless of if it's my buyer or not, because I want everybody to walk away happy and have a good experience because happy people bring happy referrals. So yeah. the value dispute thing is absolutely necessary like there's no way of avoiding it and things that can be disputed can be just putting in a contractor estimate and stating this is the amount of work that needs to be done here are a couple things that you know the appraiser may have missed or perhaps it was just a drive-by and they didn't have interior access you can submit photos along with your contractor estimate i've had people submit lists of sex offenders in the area and say that yeah. that's a major concern for resale I've had people submit pictures of power lines and state how much percentage that decreases the property value because it's close to existing power lines. I mean, I could talk all day about this. So like I said, it's kind of like knowledge is there and I, I hate to see it go to waste. So I was blessed uh -huh. to, to teach a short sale class recently for someone that you probably know, Bridget Malik. So that was awesome. That was a great experience to do that. 
with oh, wow. um, she's the owner of inspection boys and a couple okay. of oh yeah, yeah yeah i've heard of them that's awesome oh my god now i did not know that so you, you like if i gave you a short sale you'd be able like you still work in short sales right like you don't yeah kind of, okay no and that's the other thing that gets them to the closing table it depends on who's negotiating it it depends yeah. on what bank is involved Sometimes these loans are service released from servicer to servicer, and it could be changed hands so many times. Um, some banks offer different programs and incentives than others. Sometimes there's a second lien or even a third that people aren't even aware of, and then you'll get an approval letter on the first lien and then find out you know, at the 11th hour that someone else needs money. And you can't close if you don't have a payoff from the second and just as the first has been service released and transferred several times, the same thing can happen with the second. It could take really a lot of time to track those things down and the attorneys and title companies usually help with that. So it's really a matter of who the team is and who's negotiating the deal because that short sale negotiation, you know, can be three months or it could be nine months or it could be years. Yeah. So, you know, you don't want to have your money tied up for too long but as long as you're working with a team you're confident with, there's no reason why they shouldn't all close. Right. Well, that's a good point. Yeah, I mean, I'm dealing with one now. It's five months. Um, it's got to go through probate. It's going to be a night. It's going to take another nine months, probably. Like, it's just it's going to take a full year. Um, and who knows if we even get the deal? Like, so now that I know that, I'm definitely going to refer a lot of the short sales to you because, you know, I'm working with one now, and um, without you know throwing people on the bus, I'm just not really happy. You know. <laughs> Um, not confident I'm going to get that deal, but it is what it is. Um, but you like, you're talking about, you know, power lines, like no one even, I didn't even think of that. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm giving like, away all my trade secrets, but you know, <laughs> you need to know a little bit more than just how to, you know, dispute a value. It's, it's a lot more than that. It's a lot more in depth and, you know, I, I'm not going to be able to get into it here today in like yeah. the 20 minutes that we have allotted, but that's just one of the things I did. And it was because of the time that I got my license, it wasn't really a great time for commission. And I had a child at a young age. So um, being a single mom is a huge part of my story. And I'm sure you've seen how I promote my scholarship foundation, Wings for Single Parents by Homes by Jamie J. Yeah. That's through Suffolk County Community College. And I offer a $5,000 scholarship annually to any parent in need of childcare, books, tuition, whatever they want to use the money for, they can use it. So that's been like a really rewarding experience. And I put that together before I even had a 529 account for my own kids. So <laughs> well, that's all. It's that's just, all. it was like just an idea, like how we were just talking about short sales and like, I get yeah. an idea and I run with it. I'm an all or nothing kind of person. Yeah. All right. No, like that. So that was, what I was going to go with this. So I guess what got you in the real estate? And I guess it was 2005 is when you, you got in. So but like, what, like, how did you get in? So believe it or not, it was even earlier than that. I was licensed in 2005, but I probably started in like 1999 or 2000 because I was working for a family member who worked with a Century 21 office locally. And after school, I would come in and do bulk mailing, farming, looking for, you know, properties for buyers on MLS. That was when Stratus like first came out. Like they still had zone books when I started. So I'm literally a real estate fossil. I was trained on paper. Like people used to write their listings on paper, on carbon paper and like hand them out to their friends. Like that's how they got the word out that a new listing came. Yeah. There were up, up boards. If you worked in real estate office and someone called and you were lucky enough that it was your turn and your name was on the board, <laughs> you were up. So they called it an up board. And there's like all these archaic phrases and terminology that you don't hear too often today. And I feel very blessed to know that. I still have an old fashioned lockbox. I have an old fashioned lockbox key. Um, these are the things that really like excite me. <laughs> I'm like <laughs> such a super nerd, like nerd alert. So in working with my aunt and mailing out those little coupons that would say this entitles you to a free market evaluation. And right. I would call off of paper sheets, certain neighborhoods and say, so-and-so is going to be in the area doing a free market analysis for your neighbor. And we wanted to know, since we're already on Eagle Avenue, can we stop by? And I would get her listing appointments that way. And she would leave post-it notes, do this, do that, like follow up with this one. And I started asking if I could clean the office. Can I like take out the garbage once a week? Can I work for the receptionist on the weekend when she's out sick? And little by little, I started getting into it. And I think the reason that 
I fell in love with real estate was the image. I really liked the way people looked. I liked the way they dressed. I thought that they spoke very well. And it was just kind of like the image of what I thought I wanted. Like I saw somebody that had something I wanted and I had to have it. Yeah. So, um, you're talking about, you know, it's almost like volunteering. Like, you know, you're taking out the trash for people. You know, you really want to get in the business. I mean, that that to me is like, you have incredible drive. No one would do that. No one's like, oh, yeah, I want to work for free, you know, at a high school or something like that. You know, everyone wants the money. But they don't want to work for it. But I feel like you're the opposite. You're like, yeah, I want that, but I'm going to work my ass off to get it. Like, what, what drives you? It started, it started with, like, just offering to help and then they offered to pay me. They were like, look, if you do this like once a week, we'll give you 50 bucks or whatever. So it, everything I ever did in life, like just turned into a relationship. And I think I really enjoy being around people, but my true drive, like what really propelled me to do real estate full time and, and, you know, fight for this business and fight for something I believed in was in addition to the first baby that I talked about, who's now 17. I unexpectedly got pregnant again about six years ago, six and a half. And um, I was exiting a bad relationship. My father was terminally ill with cancer and I was fighting a bunch of different demons. I kind of looked around and decided like I had nothing left to lose and there was no better time than now to do it and just jump in full time because I always loved it and I did it and I always worked for attorneys and they had real estate within the practice and I was doing all this real estate and making a ton of money for other people and I was at that time homeless and penniless I literally had nothing and this was not that long ago I don't really share openly about it but this is yeah. you know the first right. time I'm really coming out and saying like yes I was a single mom yes I had some tr- tough times and trials and tribulations and all those situations that caused grief. Yeah. Um, like a lot of different things cause grief, you know, and it can be death of a family member, birth of a child, changing of jobs, uh, starting a new job, moving, yeah. leaving a relationship, starting a new relationship. All of these things cause grief. And through that pain, I just realized that like, there was only two options. I was going to curl up under a ball, under a blanket and not come out ever again, or I was going to fight and make sure that my kids had everything that they ever needed. And I refused to succeed like based off of anything other than my merit. So I think that's kind of why I've been a little bit closed mouthed about it for so long. Uh, yeah. I, don't, I don't really feel good about trying to promote I'm a single mother or promote right. you know, I had homelessness in my past or promote that I've had financial insecurity and like a lot of different issues that affected me because I truly feel that everyone has these problems and what makes me special that I should run around singing about it and ask for people to treat me differently because yeah. of the things I've gone through. So I just kind of use that all as like fuel, like in like Adam Sandler would say tackling fuel. Well, what makes you special is that like you were saying your back was against the wall and um, you know, a lot of people, most people would probably would just, you know, this is it. I accept this or whatever and that's how they live their life but like you were like no i'm going to change things and and you did you're you know you're crushing it right now i mean i've been following you probably three years since i started the business and you know i've seen you just grow your business to you know incredible lengths so i I mean i think that's an incredible story and i'm I'm, i appreciate you opening up like i said you don't really open this up to a lot of people on social media and i appreciate that Um, yeah it's not easy and I respect people with the hustle and the drive. And I think that the way that you and I connected, and I'm not sure if you even remember this, but we connected because you cold called me. I did. (laughs) And when you cold called me, I was like, wow, that is awesome. I'm like, that takes, you know, a real pair because most people today won't, wouldn't go that far. And I think I came across like a couple of investment properties very shortly after and I remembered you and I yeah. said the phone and I called you back and that deal didn't work out but yeah. we stayed in touch through that relationship because that's how I was taught I was taught to do all the things that nobody wants to do so from yeah. my calling around the neighborhood and circle dialing like I was probably 13 the first time I cold called someone they told me to go f myself or whatever and I was just <laughs> like okay like I was told to call the whole list so I just did it and yeah doing things you don't want to do is when you know 
there's no pleasure without like a little pain. oh gosh i yeah i believe me i didn't want to do that i still don't want to do that i'm a <laughs> you know i'm an accountant cpa by trade like we're not known for having you know guts and going out there and doing things we're uncomfortable doing like if anything the opposite but um no i just knew like if i wanted to be successful or even succeed at all in this business i got to do things that make me uncomfortable and you know reaching out to over well over a thousand agents and most of them either just not responding or telling me to go f myself um yeah most people would quit after like 20 or 100 or 200 but you know you just got to keep going and don't take it personally right and, right uh, so i'm curious about since you're an accountant what sparked an interest for you in real estate uh that's a great question um so there was first off i didn't even know you can make money in real estate growing up and like through high school and college like you just i don't know i thought like yeah there's real estate agents and that's it like i didn't know investing was a thing and um when i graduated college i went to obviously accounting i worked at a small firm and you know i'm doing their 1040s their tax returns and i'm like looking at all all my rich clients they all had real estate either right. they'd have a k1 pickup from like some kind of investment property um, something that they owned, a house, whatever. Every single one of them had the same common interest. So I'm like, all right, there's something here. You know, then you go down that rabbit hole. I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Um, I, I read whatever other books, that, real estate books there were, YouTube. And then I just got hooked. I was like, this is awesome. I got to figure out a way uh, to do this because I truly like that. Like I was way more passionate about that than accounting. Um, so I knew like, one, I don't want to be chained to my desk, you know, 90 hours a week from January to April. Uh, that's, I knew that pretty early on. <laughs> and, um, you know, I just enjoy it. Like it gets me excited, the real estate part. So to me, it's not work. I'm not like sitting here like, oh, I got to interview Jamie now. You know, it's I'm excited <laughs> about this. <laughs> like, this is fun to me. So um, yeah, if you're going to tell me like, I got to do this for the rest of my life or accounting, I'd be like, yeah, I'd rather pick the real estate stuff because that's fun. And um, yeah, it just excites me more. I can agree with that. And I also agree with the sentiment of, I enjoy not knowing where I'm going to be that day. When I had to do the nine to five thing, it was hard and there was a commute every day and I wasn't there and present for things I wanted to be there for with my older daughter. She was in before care and after care. And I just felt a prisoner. I would wake up thinking, yeah. I don't want to go to work. Like, I don't really want to do this today. And in real estate, I can't think of a single time other than a recent hurdle where I woke up and said, I don't want to go to work today. Yeah. Not a single day. I wake up and I don't know where I'm going. I don't right. know who I'm going to meet or how much money I'll make. This is a business where you have an infinite income. You can make as much right. money as you want. You really good. Yeah. There's yeah. no other business in the world that you can just make as much money as you want. I can't think of one. And, uh, and it's like the freedom too. like you, if you wanted to, you can be like, all right, let's take a day off. Let's do something. You know, like you have the freedom to do whatever you want. Like if you work around a desk, you're kind of just stuck to that desk and it's right. hard to like get out and like, you know, particularly with kids, like you got to go pick them up. You got to drop them off. You got to do this. You got to do that. Like you can do that in real estate. You can't really do that if you have a nine to five, because that's truly what it is. Nine to five. <laughs> oh, I can, I can do that, but I'm pretty sure that like my children would divorce me if they could, because they hear it constantly. I'm constantly on the phone. I'm constantly negotiating deals. Everything is important. I have to stop in the car while we're like arriving to our destination so I can finish a deal or negotiate something back and forth. And then in this business, it always feels like it'll be a quick phone call. Like, okay, I just have to this person. I was waiting for this person. And then I finish that call and I have to then call the lender to verify the pre-approval from the offer. And then I'm waiting for the seller to call me back to make a decision. So like one thing snowballs into so many things and they're all equally important. And I really truly value my reputation and my availability for my clients. So I don't miss a phone call. And it's, it's so intense for me that I have an assistant and now I've converted my phone and ported my cell phone number to another system that rings on my phone, her phone, and any app that we put that on, on any device and our computers. Okay. So I literally never miss a phone call. And if I do, it's because when it, we're both on the phone already. Yeah. Well, that's so, I was going to ask you that too. So you now have a team, you know, um, you've grown your business to the point where 
you know, I see you have like your assistant. I don't know who else is on your team, but you know, I guess tell me a little bit about like how you're structured. Like you have some employees under you and you know, yeah. Stuff of that nature. So I actually never thought I needed a team. And like many others in this business, I am a control freak and I like everything done a certain way. And I have, I'm very high functioning with OCD and probably some other stuff that hasn't been diagnosed yet, <laughs> but I need everything to be a certain way. So I, I, when I first hired my assistant, handing her a file, like with a listing and all of the signed paperwork was like the hardest thing I ever did. I was like holding it. She had to like rip it out of my hands. And I, she's like, are you ready? Like, give me surrender the file. And I was like, uh, like, I really didn't want to give it to her because my litigation paralegal background and being All such right. a stickler for paperwork. Like I just, I'm like, my broker always says there's two things you're judged for. It's your paperwork and your personality. And he's like, I've seen your paperwork. And I'm like, not mine. I'm like, my paperwork is good. <laughs> so I'm just like, so weird about certain things. I didn't want to let go, but in order for the business to scale and grow, I had no choice. And it just so turned out that my assistant was also a licensed real estate agent. Mm -hmm. So I gave her an opportunity and I said, look, I could use help with these other tasks and you can make commission and bonuses. Do you want to try that? And she was like, absolutely. You know, and we just kind of ran with that. And then once I hired her, someone else I do business with asked if I would take on somebody new that he knew. And he said, you know, this is a really great person. They did very well in school. I know them, you know, personally and professionally, I think they will be a good fit for your team. And I kind of thought about it and I was like, my team, I'm like what team, you know, this has been a one man show for so long. I'm a very autonomous and independent person. So I said, you know what, I'll give them a shot. Like, go ahead, send them down. And then it was the situation kept arising where, Hey, can you help me out? I've seen you on Instagram or whatever. And I don't promote or hire, but when people come and ask for help, I say, yes, I'm kind of a yes, man. <laughs> well, Okay. That's interesting. Um, I mean, that's how you get to the next level really, right? You, you kind of, you got to delegate a little bit more. It's tough to let go. You know, like I, I experience it, like even things in my business, I still do. And I probably shouldn't, you know, I probably should like hire it off to like, a, or send it off to a VA or something like that. Or, but yeah, I mean, but you, you kind of let go. It sounded like, and now you're at that, you know, that next level where, you know, you have people that are working under you and uh, yeah, no, that's how you get to do, you know, you go from 10 to 20 deals or 20 to 40 deals or whatever. I don't even know how many, you're probably crushing it these days doing more than that, but you know what I mean? That's how you get to do mass volume in this business. Right. So it, that's kind of how it went. It multiplied in that regard where I think the first year I was doing full-time real estate, I closed one deal and it was a short sale. So like my whole focus and energy and everything I had went into that. And um, like I said, I had other things going on personally that I was addressing and the next year I did five nice. and then I said, I want to double it. So like the following year I did like 12. And then again, I was like, let's double it. And then I did 25. And then nice. I think the something like that. And the year after, don't quote me, my numbers might be a little off. I'm, I'm very forgetful, believe it or not. So the following year, I think I sold 75. Wow. You did yeah. 75. <laughs> and that's when I was I like, I need help. Like we, we need more help. Oh my but God. I never had to ask for help and I'm not like super religious or anything, but I am spiritual. And I've found that God has done for me what I can't do for myself. Like whenever yeah. there was a need, I don't know if I pray the right way or if there's a certain thing that's supposed to be right. done, but usually it's like, Oh my God, please help me. Or like, how am I going to get through this? And then like, it's just, the situation is resolved and there's right. some form of solution just presents itself. And I actually recently saw a really crazy documentary on Amazon about like a rags to riches story with this man. Yeah. I don't know if you've heard of it. it was, I think it was called Mooley, either Mooley or Mooley. No, and yeah, I'll write it down. It, it was called? super interesting. It was a really good story, but he kept like having these visions and then doing whatever he thought he should do. And then just like amazing things happened for him. Oh, that's pretty cool. I got to check that out. Um, yeah. So when was that? 2021 you sold 75? Um, 75 houses was 2022. That's wild. And then, so I was going to ask you, like, how did you grow your business though? From, you know, that whole path, you know, five, 10, now up to 75. Like, what did I do? 
Yeah, like, like I said, it was a it was a whole lot of prayer. Like just God help me. Like I li- like I said, I had nothing. Um, I was at one point living in a foreclosure, and then I moved in. Like I moved into a different place that was a short sale, and they sold it. And then I had to find another place, and I moved into another foreclosure. And I was blessed with the opportunity to buy, and I bought a condo. And just like anytime there was a need for something, God showed up. And was it like um a refer I'm saying is it all referral based? Referral. Yeah. yeah. And but but that doesn't just happen. Like you don't pray to God and go, "Oh my god, you know, I really wish this phone would ring and then my clients will just call me and need me." I thought about it for years and I tried to study other people's businesses and see what they did and how they created a referral basis and what like platforms they used. So I know Buffini is like a big thing. Like he's good with referral stuff, but honestly, what I did was I started small because I didn't have much, you know, it was just like me in a car. (laughs) So I would take my business cards and distribute them wherever I would go. And any places that I visited, I would leave my business cards. And um, that was really the start of it. Then I started wearing t-shirts that said, want to buy a house. Or this mom sells real estate, got referrals, or a hat, or anything I did in the community or with the kids' schools, I showed up right. wearing something that said I did real estate. And it didn't matter if I had sold one house or a hundred houses. I showed up as if I was the only person in that town who did real estate. Nice. And like yeah. I believed in it. I just believed it. I was like, this has to happen. Like I've tried other ways and it didn't work. And I've always loved this. And I had this curiosity and this spark inside of me like you said about the excitement and I just said I'm just going to keep doing this like I have to just keep doing it and eventually it'll work then I started sending out Christmas cards okay I sent out my Christmas cards at first I just used my iPhone whose ever phone numbers were in there and anytime I work with someone I save them as Anna buyer or Bob seller and I started saving everybody like that. So when I just hit buyer, all of my list of people came up because you can't afford a CRM in the beginning. That's right. what you have, your cell phone and Facebook. That's a CRM. Right. It tells you their birthday. It tells you all kinds of stuff. You can touch them, contact them. It's a great vehicle. It's a good tool. Yeah. So it's all very, very small stuff, like very small potatoes in the grand scheme of things. And I started then buying magnets that were in the shape of a business card. So each time I sent out a greeting card, I would throw a magnet in there. Okay. It seemed silly and like, you know, I didn't think it would mean anything, but to this day I show up to people's homes and my business card is on their refrigerator. My face and my picture is actually on people's refrigerators. They save these things for years. Interesting. Yeah, no, that I, I actually uh did the magnet thing this year. I gotta give you your I think I got you I got you more than <laughs> I got you more than just a magnet, but it it's it was supposed to be a calendar and they screwed it up. And uh, it's just a picture. It's my logo. I'm like, what? What am I gonna do with this? So I just like threw it in those uh, in the goodie in, bag. In the bag. I gotta give you that next time I'm out there. I know. Forgive me. It's been like quite the eventful few months. Um, yeah. It's all so right. Other things I've done, like just postcards. And in the beginning, that's hard. I. What am I gonna send a postcard about? I see people on Instagram posting so many just closed or just under contract. Right. And I, I'm going to send you a postcard, but what do I send you? I don't have a listing. I don't have something to share with you, but there's other things to send. You know, you can send somebody a free half dozen bagels or partner up with somebody around town for a cup of coffee or offer people something of value that they might want and to hold on to that flyer. Right. So there's many different opportunities. You just have to look for them. So, you know, the postcard thing for Blue Ridge, like Blue Ridge is my main headquarters. Like I want to sell as many condos in Blue Ridge as possible because that's what I call my farm. Yeah. Fossil people like me, we have a farm, you send them postcards, you continue to hit that same neighborhood all the time. And I wanted to sell condos in Blue Ridge. It was an area I was familiar with. So after about eight years, eight years, of sending postcards once a month, every two months, whatever I could afford, going to the clubhouse, dropping the flyer there, making sure to be present in the area, introducing myself to people at the clubhouse, stopping by the, you know, the restaurant they have there on site, like stopping yeah. by the pool when they have their 4th of July party. Like yeah. it's a lot of work and relationship building and people saying, oh yeah, I know Jamie. Oh yeah, th- I know Jamie and she sold my house. And then eventually when I started getting listings, everyone started finding out. 
that it was me and I was selling them consistently for more money and for quicker than the average agent. And then I started using that on the postcard. Oh, there you go. So it it was a really long time of relationship building. And this business really truly does take time, but you have to start somewhere. So I just kind of really threw a shot out in the dark and picked an area that I liked and it started to work out. How do the postcards work on the on on the realtor side? So I send out postcards for the investing, but it clearly labels like, hey, cash offer, no repairs, like things like that investors, why we get deals, right? So it's different for realtors. Like I've seen realtors send me stuff and it's like a picture of them. And <laughs> like, does it like, what are the numbers like on that? Do they, they must work. Um, so if I'm looking in my like handy dandy. Yeah, I figured you got. Uh, I actually happen to have some stuff like right behind me. This is like what I send. It's like literally, I don't know. Like, yeah, so like um, this one, for awesome. example, says like, I'm not just a real estate agent. I'm your neighbor. Oh, yeah. And it's Valentine's Day themed. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. so like i found the catchy colors people liked this one says sizzling this summer oh that's great um this one's guess who's selling blue ridge number one listing and selling agent in blue ridge condominiums 25 units sold this was like a recent one just with an under contract on the back yeah and then i did like a huge one with a bunch like once i accumulated a lot of sales i sent this out to blue ridge and then the lender oh. put something on the back because they had like a homes for heroes program yeah so i offer the opportunity to friends too like people who want to advertise on it like we can split it and then everybody gets something we did a spring cleaning one once with a friend who has a cleaning company okay so i try to get as creative as i can because you want to provide people something of value if yeah, you're for giving sure. them mail, everybody's sending the same thing. And unless yeah. you're giving them something, they're not going to call you or they'll just throw it out. Yeah. Like, are you just mailing to Blue Ridge or are you going Medford? So, like, sometimes I'll pick other areas, but I haven't um, found a lot of success in that. I found that having a main focus and hitting the same area repetitively gives the people a no like and trust factor. And if yeah. nothing else, you may not get a call, but they're starting to recognize your face. And who you are. Okay. And that's why it took eight years, you know. So if you can afford right. to send it to multiple different locations, God bless you. But for me, it made the most sense financially to just focus on one main area. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. And you got to do it multiple times. Like I'm doing, um, I picked certain zip codes, right? I ran a list, high equity, whatever. Um, but I did the first mailing, got nothing. Second mailing, you know, I actually just locked up a deal. But the point is, like, you got to mail them. You might mail them four or five times until you get something, you know. And, uh, you know, the numbers that we're mailing at, it's very expensive. So, um, but it works. It's like a very consistent marketing channel. Like, you get X amount of calls and that many leads. So, I'm not sure if you can hear that, but the dog is just. No, no, I heard nothing. The house, so I'm distracted by that. I'm sorry. No, you're good. You're good. Um, so, yeah, no, the postcards are great. But for anyone who doesn't want to dive into that or can't afford the expense of paper yeah. mailings, we yeah, have a of Facebook, so. Instagram, like all these platforms are free. It's like free yeah. advertising. So it's so much easier today than it was like when you and I first started. So yeah, I would always tell people if you want to start in this business, don't do postcards right away. Maybe, right. Not, but social media, like I, just started posting. I just wanted to get accountable. So I would just put things out and people that I knew would follow me. And then it's like a icebreaker because you see them at like whatever, the you know New Year's party or whatever. And they're like, hey, Mike, uh, so you're in real estate. And it just kind of opens up. It breaks that barrier. Um, so that, yeah, for sure. Then that's a- It all goes back to relationships. 100%. 100%. I've seen so many people. I actually had the experience. I think it was last summer. I was out at a place in Patchog. And someone shouted across the restaurant and goes, look, it's Homes by Jamie J. And I nearly like peed my pants. I was so embarrassed, but I was like, hi. And like, I truly to this day have no idea who this person was, but they <laughs> no, know me, works. you know? And like, that's worth more than any postcard. That's hey, so it works. That's awesome. Yeah, um, crazy. Uh, all right. So we got... We got through a lot. I could advance you stuff all day long, but I know you got to go. So I wanted to say, all right. So being a realtor is tough. Um, I'm just experiencing this because, you know, we talked <laughs> a little bit, we talked a little bit earlier about how I am licensed, but not really trying to get listings, but I 
I just got one back today. I, I have a co-listing that I put out last week and I have a third one. I'm just waiting on them to sign the agreement. So like I might have three listings and I got a flip that I'm going to do. That's mine. So that's going to be another listing. I got like potentially four listings and um, it's a different animal than, you know, what I'm used to. It's very, you got to deal with a lot of crap. You got to deal with the expectations of the sellers. They all want like a crazy number for the house. It's not worth that. And they're like, all right, you can just get me this. And then you can take anything off the top. Like, I'm like, no, like you're going to pay me a commission, like whatever it sells for. Like, I'm not going to, you know what I mean? Like, cause what if we don't hit your number? Then I, I don't get a commission. Like, you know what I mean? So like managing people's expectations is very difficult. Like, what would you say is the hardest part about being a realtor? So I agree with you. The unrealistic expectations on both sides are very difficult, but the number one piece of advice that I would give you or anyone else who's starting their real estate journey is time management. Because yeah. as I mentioned earlier, you're completely in control of your salary and you're in charge of how much money you make. So by having good time management skills, you can double your income in a year by just adding a little bit more time here and there. For example, everything that I do is in my calendar in my phone and it's connected to either just me and my assistant or me and the other team members on the team of where I'm going and what I'm doing. I schedule right. myself typically with like 15 minute intervals. If I'm showing four houses, I could show houses to four buyers in one day, like just on a Saturday or Sunday, I could do an open house, show four buyers, have a listing appointment and like two appraisals and a home inspection in like one day. Wow, that's wild. A lot of people that I've come across will say like, I have a doctor's appointment today. And I'm like, end? I'm like, what else? Like, you know, and I find it to be very thrilling to see how many things I can do and how many places I can get in one day. Even if I have to pick up a smoke detector at Home Depot, it's in my calendar because I know when I drop off the kid at school, how long it's going to take me to get from there to Home Depot and then to the place that I need to drop off that smoke detector. And then immediately following that is my next appointment. Jesus. Oh. And all of the lockbox codes to the place I'm going is in the calendar in the notes. Any specific information that I have to remember or a buyer's contact information, like anything that happens has to exist in the calendar. Wow. So you got everything down to a science. Like everything. I, I mean, I started. No, really? No. <laughs> no. Sounds like it. Sounds like you got like your day is boom. It's planned. You know, like this was planned, you know, <laughs> Um. I started using the calendar more, Google Google calendars, but I don't I don't live by it the way you do. So I got to get better at that. That's an important factor. If you plan to consistently sell real estate and you're managing a life, you know, a family members, children, all of those things have to be in the calendar also because sometimes like I'll have to set an alarm to pick up my kids because I just, you know, I'm going 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 and I need to have everything like regimented and it's also helpful in the hostage situation. And I don't have a nice way of saying that, but sometimes we're at an appointment and it might be going really well, or we're enjoying ourselves, and the people we're with, we're having, making good conversation. And I could stay at a person's house for a listing appointment for hours. Like oh, they're lovely yeah. people, they're feeding me, they're introducing me to their pets and letting me hold their babies. If I don't have something that alerts me and says like, you have to go, it's 15 minutes to drive to your next appointment. I'll say, oh, you know what, Mr. And Mrs. Seller, this has been such a wonderful conversation, but as you can see, like I have to get to my next. And people respect me based on the fact that how I value my time. And yeah. in the beginning of the business, I enjoy so much talking to people and I really, really, truly love helping people. So in learning from those experiences, I had to start valuing my time when I realized if I sell 75 houses in one year, how much commission is that? And if I break it down by the amount of weeks in a year and then you know months and days and hours, I did the math to figure out what an hour of my time was worth. Wow. And then I thought about it and said to myself, I don't know any other professional, whether it be a CPA, a doctor, a nurse, a lawyer that wouldn't sit down and hand someone a retainer and say, this is what I'm charging you. Yeah, I know that's my value and I know that what I'm worth, but yet I work in a business where I work for free daily. I don't get paid. So I have to remind myself of that when I'm sitting there enjoying a, you know, biscotti and a coffee with a 95 year old seller, 
I have to cut that short and say, you know, I'll come back, no problem. And I've adopted many clients. If someone I know is elderly, I come by, I bring them cookies, I'll pick up milk for them. If they're living close by to me, like I take care of my clients, like they're my own family, but it has to be within a reasonable limit. And then, you know, there's always another day tomorrow, but I can't spend an entire day on one file. Yeah, 100%. I totally agree. Wow, that is awesome. All right. All right. Let's, uh, speaking of time, I, I, I'll respect yours. And I'm sure, you're, I'm sure <laughs> yeah. your phone you're is You're like, this is going to be like 20 minutes. I was like, let me tell you a little secret here. <laughs> there's no such thing as a short story. I don't know how to make a long story short. I know these things always go far uh, longer than I, than I expect, but that's because we're, you know, hitting it off and it's going well, you know. Um, all right. So I'm sure your phone's blowing up and you got it's a lot okay. of stuff, but I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, how can people, you know, reach out to you, find you, Instagram, whatever? How can they reach out to you? So on Instagram is probably the best way. It's Homes by Jamie J. And my phone number is 631 605 9552. And of course, if you don't get me, you might get my lovely assistant, but you can text me at that number also. So I look forward to making some new connections and I'm here for it. Any questions anyone has, I just love real estate and it's never a day of work in my entire life. And I'm actually really excited for you and your real estate journey. So thank that's you. Awesome. Congrats yeah. on that. Thank you so much. All right, Jamie, I really appreciate you coming on and um, you know, we'll be in touch and, and uh, I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Great. Right. Thank you for having me.